Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, another Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group uh, meeting. Uh, this afternoon's event is Changing Places to uh, Change and the Material Fate of Place, which I'll try and explain what that subtitle means uh, in the next few moments of my introductory uh, remarks. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, we uh, are recording uh, and uh, we uh, go for uh, what I call raw recording, which means I don't really want to have to get involved in editing um, the transcripts that we've recorded. So if you wouldn't mind, if you do make a, um, uh, an audio or a visible uh, contribution, which is very much encouraged, um, please be aware that it will go up onto YouTube um, unless you plead with me to edit it and then re-render it and all that sort of stuff, which I can do if need arrives. If you say anything that you really wish you hadn't said, uh, please do let me know within 24 hours because I'll be uploading the recording um, tomorrow evening, basically. Uh, and then uh, let everybody know uh, where it is uh, and that it is available. Okay, so um, if you're not presenting, if you wouldn't mind having your microphones off, um, it may well be, and this worked actually quite well in the last event, it may well be that we can have um, a verbal uh, discussion at various points rather than just a chat chat box based discussion um but but let's let each presenter do their thing uh, unimpeded um, and have the conversation if we have a conversation uh subsequently um this is a screen view of the um spg's uh, youtube channel this is where the recordings go to uh where today's recording will um find its way to uh, and it's building up a nice uh, resource. I'd like to think that people, when they can't sleep, uh, tune in here and, and watch a video. Um, and as it says there, certain people seem to be viewing them, uh, which is great. And it's also great for people who can't make it, you know, to the event live um, to catch up um, uh, in their own good, uh, own good time and own good way. Um, so this year, as in all of recent years, the Sheffield, the SPG, um, has chosen a theme to examine. Uh, and the theme that we chose to examine was changing places, having last year looked at the phenomenon of haunts, H-A-U-N-T-S, uh, from a sort of place point of view, uh, and previous, uh, previous years having other, uh, other themes. Um, and what we try and do is choose a theme that is sort of inherently multidisciplinary and probably inherently ambiguous, just so that it gives everybody something to um, connect into. Um, so I'm just trying to read the chat. Uh, so someone saying they didn't, the link didn't work, uh, but they're here. So they must have figured it out. We may be where we are on that one. Uh, anyway, um, so back to the script. Um, for various reasons, we had the opportunity to set up a parallel um, strand uh, to do with the way in which uh, campuses are changing. We've done that in collaboration with the um, higher, edu higher education research cluster here at Sheffield Hallam. Um, so we've got a twin tracking of um, a certain number of events that are badged as changing places, of which this is the second. Um, and then in running interwoven in that, there's a sequence of events, um, more specifically looking at the way in which campuses are changing. Um, and uh, I'll give a few more details on the next one of those in that sequence um, shortly. So this is what we looked at last time. Um, and the theme which I shouldn't have changed, there's an edit problem there, it should say the theme of the original Changing Places one session uh, up there, um, was to look at the way in which um, changing of place and changing of identity are uh, in, inextricably intertwined. Uh, and we had three presenters there from um, a good sort of disciplinary sort of spread, um, looking at the ways in which sort of international migration, moving in and out of care, care residents, residents in care homes, um, and um, sort of uh, life course uh, trauma and recovery and repair as it, as it attaches to place um, can all be analyzed um, 
from the points of view of the social sciences, art and design, creative writing, uh, and what have you. Uh, and we had a really great discussion um, towards the end of um, uh, that session. Um, and that's why I'm saying if, 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 we, uh, if we feel the mood is right, we can have a discussion um, verbally um, uh, as we go through today's uh, session or towards the end of today's session. Uh, the next uh, SPG event is going to be on the 25th of May, and it's the third in the Changing Campus uh, sequence. Um, and we have two um, keynote speakers as, as Bill Bear, uh, Carol Taylor, of course, being ex of this parish, uh, formerly of the um, uh, Education uh, Institute here at Sheffield Hallam, now at University of Bath. Um, plus colleagues um, who are going to speak on behalf of the SHU Staff Disability Network. Um, and the connecting theme there is very much matters of embodiment uh, and flow uh, upon university campuses. And, you know, deroger, the word materiality is cropping up there as it is in today's title. And I'm going to have a, a go a little bit later on explaining what on earth I mean every time I drop the word materiality into um, any of these um, current events. So today's programme is obviously uh, exploring the issue of change of place um, and places change um, in intentional ways, whether the processes of regeneration or um, neglect, which I suppose in some senses is intentional. Um, you choose to neglect something and it falls apart, falls into a state of ruin, and therefore changes, thereby changes. Um, or the use, the nature of use, or the intensity of use changes. All of those are, are mechanisms by which place can change. And, you know, places are made up of stuff and the configuration of stuff, material stuff, things on the ground and the ground itself. Um, so a place in a process of change is a material, materialized expression of all sorts of background, intangible, but very significant uh, effects, um, you know, all sorts of economic, social and cultural, political, etc. factors at play that are influencing um, the pace or the, the happening of change or the lack of change uh, and what have you, playing out across a variety of scales, whether it's global events influ influencing things or uh, uh, very local uh, um, focused um, factors and influences. And what I saw as the connected, because we, we invited sort of expressions of interest to join in this year's theme. And then I, in, conju in con conjunction with others, um, thought about how to cluster them into particular events. And it struck me that there was certainly um, a cluster that was all about change of place and its influence on identity. And then there was another cluster, which is today's event, um, which was about how do we look at stuff, material stuff, the physical form of place and the stuff that's in place um, as part of change processes and how do, we, how do we focus on that for a change? And not necessarily focus on that from a, uh, a sort of structural point of view and get awfully excited about, you know, what's going on in the economy or, or et cetera, et cetera but sort of zoom in a bit more and think what's happening with stuff um, at a sort of local level and how can stuff speak? And, and leaving that as a question, you know, can stuff speak? Um, and that I think we're gonna get a really rich sense of from our presenters um, today using the various methods through which they spend their time thinking about stuff and how stuff speaks and what have you. Um, and what I really just wanted to confess for a few moments um, to you by way of opening remarks is how whenever I set out to say, let's talk about stuff and let's, let's let stuff speak, I soon run into a cul-de-sac and people reappear. And I'm not particularly going to apologise for that because at the end of the day, we are people and we can't completely helicopter out of context and you know, do these sort of esoteric, let's just listen to stuff and ignore people and, and, and the context that make people have nice lives or horrible lives. Um, and so I started thinking about stuff 
and inevitably people started creeping back in. And, and, and in particular, I got into this little sort of furrow of looking at what are called nail houses. Um, nail house is a Chinese expression um, that refers to um, uh, what you might call, or what developers might call, intransigent locals who won't sell their houses to us, um, who, who, who refuse to budge from a large development plot and sort of resolutely stay there, um, as you see depicted um, in this image. And in China, it all gets quite hairy because the developers then literally gouge out the, gra the ground from around the pin houses until such time as the pin houses start to sort of become distinctly unsafe to live in. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, intransigent residents then sort of flee for their lives uh, whilst the building um, crumbles uh, around them through, through uh, the kind of processes that you see uh, in that image. Um, and the issue of, um, the issue of uh, nail houses um, is, is a sort of global phenomenon. And the, the reason why a house becomes a nail house is because of the attitudes and the situation of the person who lives in that house. That person decides, I am not gonna surrender and accept the offer that I've been given. I am not gonna surrender to the bullying or other uh, inducements that have been fired at me to get me to move. I am gonna stay where I am. And then bizarrely, the developer decides in at least two of these instances, well, okay, we'll just build the road around you no matter how crazy that might look. And it certainly looks crazy in um, pretty much each of those uh, images. So this is a bit like a QI question for you as an opener. Um, which of these three examples is not a nail house? The, um, the motorway one that you can see is the M62. There's a farm on the M62 at which the motorway splits and goes round. Um, I know the answer to this one, if I may. Okay. <laughs> it is the M62 one. Um, okay. I've actually made a film about that house. <laughs> oh, okay, well, excellent. Well, go and, ahead. And it, well, it was very much to do with it was to do. There is this urban myth, isn't it, that the farmer yeah. wouldn't move, but it's to do with the topography and the lie of the land or lay of the land. Um, yeah. I think it's from the 1700s that house, if yeah. I if I remember correctly. When I filmed there. It was um, it, it was an old film. It was like back in, oh my God, like 2008, 2009 or something. Um, it was a very, very cold February, um, terrible snow. And the farmer had had to go out and bring all the lambs into his living room. So they were all in front of the fire, um, wrapped in newspaper. Anyway, that's nothing to do with nail houses, but it was a nice anecdote. So no yeah, I made a really interesting house, interesting history. And when I was a kid driving past there, I always wanted to know who lives there. One day I want to go in there and check it out. Excellent. So I was fortunate to, yeah, to be able to do that. Excellent. Well, that, was, that was completely <laughs> unplanned, but I'm really glad you, 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 you made that inter intervention, Esther. Um, absolutely. The M26, no, M62 um, is an urban myth. Uh, there is a geological fault. Um, it's not a nail house, although everybody talks about it as the sort of UK's premier um, obstinacy, uh, resistance to the man kind of uh, uh, situation. But as far as I can tell, the other two, both Chinese examples, are real. Um, and the house that's got the car in front of it was eventually knocked down, but only after a heck of a lot of um, bypassing tarmac seems to have been laid down on that um, otherwise multi-lane road. Uh, crazy sort of situation. But anyway, materiality plus people's attitudes uh, is where I think we will uh, uh, be exploring today. And at the local level, uh, thinking about how um, things are expressed at local level, they embody or they, or they oppose processes of change uh, and have all sorts of interesting narratives wrapped, uh, wrapped into them. Um, that is a picture of the owner of the house that you saw a few moments ago that had the car in front of it, um, waving his, um, his, uh, uh, his property entitlement, uh, by which he said, no, you're not having my house. Uh, eventually he did surrender it, but uh, anyway. So what do people do locally with stuff? 
and how does stuff act back? That I think is where we're going to be uh, uh, covering um, uh, in today's uh, in today's proceedings. Um, and as I've already revealed, really, this re this requires. Uh, certainly for the purposes of this opener, it requires me um, to retreat somewhat from pure materiality. And I've often done this retreat. I've often said, right, let's talk about stuff. Let's let stuff speak. And then I've realized that stuff is mute and stuff only speaks through us uh, with our voice and, and speaks to our concerns and our scale and our temporalities and, and what have you. Um, so much so that when Carol, a number of years ago, asked me to write um, a chapter for her edited collection that you see the cover of there, I said in the, my abstract proposal, yeah, I'm going to write about how we could be like bricks and we could learn to think like a brick. And the more I thought about that in the context of an educational publication, which inherently is to do with humans, the more I realized that actually I couldn't sustain my argument that we could go for some hardcore post-humanist, yeah, let's all be bricks. Um, and actually what you end up with is, you know, how can the human, when they think about the positionality of a brick, gain some kind of uh, perspective that augments usual human perspectives, but essentially we're still thinking about human scale, we're still thinking about the fact that bricks become houses, we're still thinking about things that are of concern to us. How could we think or speak of anything that was not of human concern? I'll leave that not as an assertion, I'll leave that as a discussion point if anyone wants to come and challenge me, but um, if they do challenge me, I'll just chuck a copy of my chapter at them and say, well, look, all I've ever wanted to say on this is in that chapter. So there we are. Um, in order to um, close out my opening remarks, let me just um, delve into a, a different book, which is a book by Peter uh, Poromantsev. I'm sure that's not how I'm supposed to pronounce it, but it's a book about how um, Moscow life has gone really weird in the last 20 years, written by um, a documentary filmmaker. And the reason I wanted to just focus in on that, apart from the fact that I was reading it recently, um, is that he has some nice turns of phrase that capture some of this stuff about the interplay between the human and the stuff around us and the way at which it is or isn't changing. So um, to sort of start us off as we think for that search for change and, and the effects of change, um, change can be disorientating. Streets that were familiar suddenly don't seem familiar and that makes us feel odd and, and uncomfortable sometimes energized, but often uncomfortable. And certainly in terms of his, his argument, he's talking about Moscow as a disorientated place because of the scale, pace, and purpose perhaps of the um, urban change that's been going on there. And in his book, he introduces um, a local figure called Alexander Mozahev, who is a bit of an urban explorer come psychogeographer, who leads tours um, around the heart of old Moscow to try and find old Moscow um, and, uh, and show people what is being lost and what has been lost and to summon the ghosts of the things that have gone. Um, and he and his companions conduct sort of uh, funeral ceremonies for buildings that are about to go or have gone um, on site um, uh, uh, and, and try and ceremonialize it. But as you get further into the chapter that um, has been written in this book, it becomes sadder because Mozahev uh, uh, reveals a sort of deep nostalgia that is attached to buildings. And it seems to have something to do with the fact that he connects to his dead parents through um, trying to recapture, resummon the buildings that his um, parents were associated with. And he seems to invest a significance in buildings as being um, almost reservoirs or archives of um, time and, and, and sort of ways of resisting sort of an atrophy of, 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 of memory or, um, or, or uh, uh, attachment. Um, so he talks about buildings as, a vict buildings as being a victory over time which is a nice phrase. I'm not quite sure that I understand or agree uh, with it. Um, old walls and doors know something that we can't understand. Yes, I suppose they know how to be old walls and doors, and they have a lot of um, sophistication in, in the role of performing doorness and, and wallness, but I'm not quite sure what that gets us to as humans. But he thinks that 
as I say, the buildings are reservoirs and they're intertwined with the stuffness of this built residue. Um, something remains that is important for us and that stuff serves um, that purpose. So it will be interesting to see uh, what the other uh, presenters make uh, from their point of view in terms of the role of stuff or the presence of stuff and the, the, the local um, performance of stuffness. Um, and if I have any question that I want to pose for future discussion, um, maybe we could have a go at trying to take it now um, when I finish this presentation. Um, it's that I've characterized um, this, uh, this person's stance as being nostalgic. And we tend to use nostalgic in a very pejorative sense nowadays. And nostalgia obviously emerges originally as a definition of an illness, an illness caused by a sort of aching longing by Swiss mercenaries for their homeland uh, that could be treated in various ways in order to stop them aching uh, so badly. Um, and nostalgia has now come to mean uh, if we follow Svetlana Boim, um, that people are sort of, uh, they've caught the, the bug of modernism, but it's gone a bit warped and weird. They've got this notion of past, present, future, and an idea that we are all headed somewhere, but they don't like the pace at which we're headed, or they don't like the direction in which we're headed, and they yearn to reverse the arrow, believing that the arrow is travelable, travelable backwards which is a modern notion that, you know, there is a progression of time. The idea of going backwards is, is a bit loopy, but pre-modern, you didn't really have a notion of the past. So it's a disease of modernity, nostalgia, and that that is all wrapped up perhaps in this guy's sort of investment in the stuffness of the buildings and the fragments that remain. And I just wonder whether anybody wants to help me try and um, figure out whether or not this is nostalgia at play, and if so, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but anyway, that's enough of me chuntering on. Um, one of the reasons I've chunted on is because, um, sadly, one of our three speakers is not available um, due to uh, emergent uh, circumstances. So Eve isn't able to speak to us today about the ways in which homes can be seen as a, a live sort of recording device for energy consumption and that we could try and visualize flows of energy through through a home and see this in terms of um, um, uh, uh, an existence almost of of a phenomenon that we, we, work, we can't get to unless we find ways of artistically um, summoning it uh, into, into the open. But um, we'll get Eve along at some future point to um, talk to us about the work she's doing um, on that. So um, we have um, uh, Joe and Rosemary um, shortly to start speaking, uh, and then we'll follow on with um, Esther. Um, does anybody want to say anything profound or otherwise about nostalgia, or should we just move, move quickly on to uh, um, calling on Joe and Rosemary to start their talks? Um, we can do this with voice, I think, because we've got a, a, an intimate enough audience and we're all known to each other pretty much. So if anybody wants to just sort of turn off their mic and, and say something, that's absolutely fine for this uh, proceeding today. I think Joe's itching to say something or she's just itching to get on with her talk. I can't quite work it out. No, she's not. Oh, she's just wriggling in her seat. Right. OK, so uh, I'm just trying to make sure that I can see everybody. I'm sure we've got more than six people. I can only see six people on my screen. Is everybody else gone? No. Uh, no, we've, we've got about 13 people, I think, Luke. I think so. Okay, thank you. Okay, the bait is dangling. I think the time for the bait is running out. So I'm going to move uh, move straight on to um, Joanne and Rosemary. I'm going to stop sharing. So uh, Joanne and Rosemary, I'm going, to, I'm going to start sharing. Uh, bear with me a second. Is yep. that now full screen? That's working. That's lovely. So, yeah, hi, we're Joe and Rosemary. I'm Joanne. I'm from um, Sheffield Hall and I'm course leader for graphic design. This is my lovely colleague. <laughs> hi, I'm Rosemary and I work at University of Leicester in the School of Museum Studies. I should say, I mean, we've we've kind of worked together, we've curated sort of exhibitions together, we've kind of written together, we've got a sort of ongoing collaborative research um, sort of partnership, I guess, but we're 
it's quite nice to kick off today actually because we're here to kick off a project and um, we're not presenting findings on something we're right at the beginning of a new body of work so we're coming along to use the the space and place group really as a kind of community of critical friends hopefully to help us in the thing that we are trying to do at the moment so in that spirit I hope you will be um I don't know open and generous in comments criticism feedback and so forth it's very much like a kind of beginning um, of a project. So I'm going to hand over to Rosie to um, let her begin the introduction. Okay, thanks Jo. Um, when we were planning this, um, <laughs> we uh, joked about what image to have at the start of this um, presentation and um, uh, I'm very happy to see that Jo, who marvellously put together these slides, uh, has, has gone with our choice of uh, the local shop for local people. Um, as, uh, as the, uh, the, the image for you to rest your eyes on while I introduce this, uh, this subject. So, um, yeah, so this afternoon, we'd like to share our project in progress, which is called Staying Local. Um, and it's really a, a project which explores how we might develop complex and nuanced understandings of place by attending carefully and creatively to the local in its various forms. Um, the critical discourse often seems to connect the concept of the local with disparaging terms like insular, small-minded, provincial and parochial. In our fast-moving, virtually orientated society, um, our highly interconnected world, it's the global rather than the local which seems to command attention. So we hope that the staying local project can go some way towards challenging this habitual thinking by investigating the potential for the local to act not as a perimeter, but as an aperture, a space through which the world can be seen. Central to this project is the exploration of new and creative methodologies for deeply interrogating our relationship to place, mm -hmm. opening this aperture and generating new understandings of the local. We'd like to develop a network of scholars, artists, curators and community activists to explore these ideas and share their own creative methodologies for staying with and activating the local. Um, we're going to be putting together an AHRC network grant in order to facilitate this. In our preliminary research, we identified five ways in which we can usefully explore the local. And um, just thinking back to Luke's introduction, uh, some of these ways indicate the way in which local or the idea of the local has changed recently. Um, so in terms of these five ways, um, during this presentation, we'll give a short introduction to each of these thematic areas, together with an example of an artist who's developed creative mm -hmm. strategies for exploring this aspect of the local in their own work. And today we've selected five examples of artist work from the many that we've identified, because they allow us to kind of quickly articulate what we mean by each of those thematic areas. In the broader project, we're alert to considerations of the way perspectives of the local are shaped by gender, cultural background, race, class, sexuality, and physical health and disability. So over to you, Jo. Thanks, Rosie. So um, I'm just going to advance my slide. So we've got a set of questions which we're going to like flash at you at the beginning here and we're going to return to them again um, at the end. So like we're, we're here, as I said in, in the beginning, really with a, a sort of spirit of um, kind of open ended, hoping for your generosity in terms of contributions and your uh, perspectives. A cup of tea has just arrived, which is very nice there. Um, really, we're, we're interested to know whether some of the things that we're talking about resonate with your own um, disciplinary perspectives. Obviously, in our funding application, we're, we have to assert the potential importance of what we're doing. And we're trying to, although we're working very much within creative practice, we're kind of interested in how this might connect as a means of investigation more broadly. And I'm aware, obviously, in space and place group there are people from 
all kind of um, disciplines and backgrounds. Um, so we're interested to know how it might resonate. We're interested to think if there are kind of, um, I don't know, emissions or things that you think might help us uh, that we might need to think about in terms of strengthening the framing of the project. So any kind of things you might consider there would be really helpful. Um, and then kind of we're also interested, this is a network, is about making connections. So we partly extending a, a, an invitation to you, you know, are, are you interested in these themes and ideas that we're going to talk about would you like to kind of come and continue the conversations um, and maybe there might be other people that you know of or other kind of people through the network and your your own external uh, networks that you think we might um, usefully talk to so there's an extended invitation here that if you'd like to get in touch those are our kind of details at the bottom We'd be really happy to try and um, develop the conversation in this session but also afterwards so these are the questions so I think Rosie you're going to start and then uh, we're going to take you through these these um, sort of five themes I guess that we've identified and try to give an example of the type of work that we're talking about Okay, yeah, so the first of the five themes, which are not in any particular order, is um, local identities. And we kind of came up with this idea, um, thinking about how the local is, is sometimes framed in terms of, um, yeah, kind of like sort of complex ideas of of identity, who is local, who isn't, who belongs, who doesn't, um, and the kind of quite sort of contentious uh, feelings that that can sometimes create. So, um, as we know, sadly, nationalism is rising across the world and the UK left the European Union. Um, we've also got additional structures of devolved UK government, um, offices for regional mayors and economic concepts like the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine create increasingly complex allegiances to place. Um, and we find that ideas of the local are mobilised in debates around immigration, the presence of refugees in an area, uh, and embedded racism, uh, as well as other issues around inequalities, social justice. And, and local identities. Um, so we're thinking about what kind of, sort of creative methodologies, what kind of strategies um, uh, do we see um, for kind of investigating um, and perhaps making visible different local identities. And we've chosen here um, just to speak very briefly about the work of um, the Welsh artist Edwin Williams. Um, so this is one of his drawings and he posts these digital drawings almost daily on his Instagram account. Um, and you can see this particular one uh, shows the thoughts of a Welsh mountain. You can just see the face of the, of the mountain um, picked out at the top there. Um, so it's the thoughts of a Welsh mountain as it looks down upon a queue of large people carriers nose to tail on the road below. Why do you speak so loudly, it wonders. What we're interested in here in terms of the strategies for thinking about the local um, that Williams is developing and employing, uh, through his drawings are, are playful and they're uh, sometimes a kind of polemic mixture of satire and surrealism. And they often explore his local landscape of Wales specifically addressing issues such as gentrification, second homeowners, class, landscape tourism, and the Welsh language. Okay, over to you. So I'm in a slightly selfish way going to talk about myself for a moment. Um, so the, the second of our themes is really about how the lockdown sort of changed relationships to place. Um, and obviously the, the pandemic brought travel restrictions, it brought, uh, it kept people to particular locations for protracted periods. And we think that that has created, uh, um, certainly during that period, it new and different Every time we kind of ended up having to engage with the local areas uh, in new ways, you know, where, where we walk, where we could shop, um, where we, you know, what our local resources were. I think 
we, we changed our relationship. It's certainly something in my own creative practice um, that I found where I've obviously been working at home for the last couple of years a lot through though I'm working at the university um, and I've been looking repeatedly from my window. I'm sitting in the room that that view is kind of showing at the moment uh, and the sort of sitting here in North Sheffield the lockdown really acutely reoriented me to my particular local and I ended up starting to kind of write that experience so from a first entry there on the 31st of March 2020 a couple of weeks into that first town um, I ended up writing um, a journal which was about 100 words a day um, it's now over 600,000 words um, it's become quite epic I'm still doing it I write most days uh, and each post is published as a kind of public post on my Facebook page um, I, the thing that's been very odd in terms of that notion of local and further has been the way that people that I knew I was sharing it with then started to share it with other people and I know that people have been reading it who are not my friends I mean it is a public post but I don't think I thought anybody would be interested so there's a kind of curious thing about then people meeting me um, through other connections and realizing that they've been reading it and they know these quite intimate things about this precise location um, the more that I've looked I think the more that I found to notice it feels like the process of engaging with this quite micro local is like a fractal sort of zooming in um, once you become attuned it makes the particular um, locality appear and appear again in more detail and you start you almost just through a portal looking you see a thing and then you see more of it or you see it again and it it kind of changes the relationship it feels like the repetitions of writing make visible the sight of and it's not human patterns oh sorry did i disappear then uh, I... you did go to a different universe just very briefly but you're back with us now lovely thank you luke sorry my internet is probably um collapsing uh, today apologies um so we you start to notice patterns and cycles emerging life about bird song about what gets littered um, about the antisocial behaviour of local teenagers, which I've read about, read um, an excerpt about in a previous hauntings um, space and place group. Um, and I sort of end up talking to, I suppose, about broader concepts like the madness and brokenness of the university system, um, the broader social, political, economic issues that are sort of surrounding this very precise local place, the pandemic itself, the war in Ukraine, the aperture, do, the, the local does seem to form an aperture to the global. So, this is my own practice, we'll be reflecting on that within the project. Um, but also beyond that, we've been thinking a little bit about the local as this, this idea of the non-proximal. So it seems that digital technologies and their increased ubiquity, particularly during the pandemic, mean we've, we've created these multiple locals um, so Zoom tools used to keep uh, like choirs on the go or reading groups on the go or to keep in touch with family and friends to keep the, the local groups going but happening sort of remotely or else people using sort of mutual aid uh, like Facebook pages to get care for people who might be precisely local to them but also might be people who are at a distance um, you know organising through other local Facebook pages to care for you know grand and grand or whoever. But it, it also seems that there's been a temporal non-proximity too of things happening like in a place but at different times or of a place um, evoking different times. So we've been interested in thinking about the work, the collaborative work of Phil Smith and Helen Billingshurst, who are based down in Plymouth. Um, he used like, walking, site-specific performance, um, mythogeography, dramat various tactics to explore a sort of topography of modern life, a deep topography of modern life, um, exploring psychological and physical orientations in space and time. And they produced this book called The Pattern um, that they speak about under the guise of crab and bee, their alter egos, um, to do what they call sort of web walking in this area. So short quote from them, they say, setting out to walk the margins of Plymouth um, using a labyrinth as a mental map, they found themselves exposed to a weird and ailing world of buried rivers, needle-strewn woodlands and heritage sites repurposed as smack dens. 
in response as both survival strategy and poesis, the authors reinvented themselves and their journey as a fictioning, generating multiple identities and joining in with numerous long running stories. So this idea of fictioning is borrowed from the art theorist Simon O'Sullivan, and he uses it to mean things like sort of art rituals that might disrupt both archive and fieldwork. Um, destabilizing the idea of there being a single reality. So this sort of temporal, these spaces, multiple things happening in the same place, but kind of at different points in the day or by different, the way that different users might use them. So these two artists work with games and actions such as tying threads, sprinkling ash, scrying puddles, picking rubbish. Um, and as a result, they end up making all these connections to Plymouth's military history, its cultural heritage, its current economy, its everyday life, some of which is pretty feral, um, and to all of the non-human um, agents that are making place um, at the same time. It feels like a very expansive investigation of the local, a sort of gener generation of local multiplicity. And we're interested in working with them on this project, and they've agreed to be part of the project, um, because they develop what they call shifty methods for being there. Um, and uh, Phil Smith has argued that we're living through a crisis of separation enforced by the technology of communications and everything that he and Helen do um, feels like it drives them apart from each other there in and with a pattern in the terrain is a so we'll be considering how um, as well, they've been continuing this project um, sort of through lockdown and, and under the constraints of that particular period where they couldn't do many of the normal things that they were doing and having to work sometimes through technology, sometimes in spaces and sometimes in spaces at different times. That's something that we're going to be exploring um, in the network conversations. So the third um, theme I'm gonna talk about and then I'll hand over to Rose, Rosie for the final of our five themes is this idea of the beyond human. So in, in considering um, sort of place and the local, uh, we, we wanted to think beyond the human. Um, we wanted to think about the creaturely and vegetative uh, existences that, with which we're in local proximity and about the different timescales of the, the formation um, of those, those lives lived and the formation of, um, of local landscapes. So we've been looking at the work of Tracy Hill, um, who's an artist, uh, research um, lead and, and coordinator at Art Lab at University of Central Lancashire. And her projects use a lot of analog and digital methods to map um, and experience landscapes. So she's explored peat bogs and landscapes that have had um, salt extracted from them uh, in, in Cheshire. Uh, and in considering, she considers a lot how the walking body uh, maps visual and sonic traces, enabling the senses to reveal unseen subterranean landscapes. And she, she uses um, walking, talking, digital, analog tools and devices like digital scanners, sound recording, dowsing, and working with other people to do the dowsing. I don't think she's a dowser herself, um, to slow down and notice the details, to kind of witness, to record, to explore the energies of these places. And she communicates that through drawing, printmaking, paper cutting, augmented reality. We're in her attention to the infinitesimally slow time of these local places, like the formation of, of peat or the the formation of salt and its extraction, um, that there are sort of unseen materialities, unseen energies um, and life cycles beyond those that are immediately visible. So we're interested in her creative techniques for what's considering, for considering what's unseen um, and how she can help us imagine, reimagine the more extreme durations through which localities are formed and change. Back to you, Rosie. Thank you. Yeah, the um, the fifth theme or kind of area of interest relating to the local, um, we're thinking of as kind of alternative economies. So this refers to kind of environmental scholarship, but also scholarship from lots of different areas, which has highlighted the increasing need to question current economic models. And looking to like local resourcefulness to provide kind of counter narratives to unsustainable models of growth. Um, 
so almost again sort of challenging that idea of the local as seeming as if you've kind of um I don't know you've stayed local instead of expanding in this kind of um sort of amazing way you've uh, you know it actually sort of thinking well what can be gained by um creating sustainable local economies um so the slide of the um drawing that you can see here is from a project called company drink which was initiated in um, 2014 by the artist Catherine Bomb, and um, she works with a collective called My Villages. And um, Company Drinks is a community space and a social enterprise based in Barking and Dagenham. And it's effectively a local manufacturer of drinks, um, which are then sold in different markets. Um, so what it does in terms of the local community is that it brings people together and they go out on like picking trips. So um, they might be kind of foraging, I don't know, elderflower for elderflower cordial um, from kind of local bits of um, the uh, like sort of green spaces in Barking and Dagenham. Um, and sometimes they go out on like sort of coach trips together to go pick in like um, kind of reenacting this um, idea from the early 20th century where people from the east end of London would go out to Kent and um, pick hops. And um, there's kind of a similar dynamic um, happening there with, with people from Barking and Dagenham going out and, um, and kind of effectively sort of helping with the harvest, but, but using what they harvest to, to, in order to make these drinks. Um, it's a registered community interest company. And um, I don't know if you can tell from this drawing come diagram, but um, on either side of the diagram, there are uh, there's a drawing of a glass with some uh, liquid in it. Um, one of them has a price tag at the top that says one, one pound, and uh, one of and the one on the right has a price tag that says three pounds, and this refers to um, these kind of parallel markets or economies that the the drink company sort of operates within. So the the company um, sells the drinks in like local shops. Um, and if it's sold within Barking Dagenham, each drink is a pound. But it also kind of accesses um, quite sort of fancy art events. It serves the, you know, it has, a, there's been a bar where company drinks are served at like the Freeze Art Fair. Um, they've had exhibitions at the Victorian Albert um, Museum. And uh, so when when the, the context changes and it goes up market <laughs> in that way, um, the drinks are three pounds or more. Um, so there's this very kind of like sort of local, uh, local economy, and then this kind of wider sort of global economy, um, kind of running, running power, running parallel in this, um, in this very sort of socially community orientated um, community business. So I suppose like what, what you might realise from um, the, the kind of the, the presentation, we're trying to kind of, I suppose, hold uh, a, a constellation of ideas um, together. We're trying to make the local this very expansive thing. You know, it, it's not about trying to have one narrow way of looking at the local, which is often almost like the problem that we've discerned in, in, in kind of other studies, people consider the local through a particular lens we're trying to say that through creative investigation of place you can have a sort of richer and more multiple engagement um, and so we're but we're wondering what this might offer you know 
we know that happens within art practice and within, within creative practice, but we're also wondering what those kind of approaches might offer more broadly, which I guess is, is kind of where it, it potentially brings us back to the sort of the questions that we might want to, to conclude with, which is, I suppose, where, where do these kind of ways of approaching place um, and local places, where does that coincide with the things you guys might be thinking about, if, if at all, in, um, in your practice? Um, and we're kind of really just interested to have um to see where this resonates and to sort of see you know are there areas of, of sort of local thinking that you think we just so completely missed or are there areas of creative thinking where you, you know that there are particular suggestions or thoughts that you might have um as to how uh yeah what you might want to contribute um towards the project so we that is our presentation it so we're right at the beginning um of what we're doing we've been writing our application over the last sort of couple of months and we've produced I suppose a snapshot from it really today to just try to show a few examples um, so I think we'll perhaps uh, conclude and shut up and see if there are I don't know if we're having um, discussion now Luke or whether you want to hold things and we come back to stuff at the end um, whatever seems most useful. No, I'm happy to, 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 to dive straight into a discussion I'll, I'll probably guillotine it after 10 minutes um, just so that we keep things to time and then have um, open discussion at the end if if, if, if people would like that but I think we could have um, 10 minutes of uh, um, chipping in um, uh, now so if anyone would like to, to start us off um, it, it, if you are bashful, you can you can type something into the chat. Um, uh, but otherwise, if you if you'd like to vocalise your comments, that's absolutely fine. Uh, also, Becky, I see you've put something in the chat. Do you want to to to, to speak to it, or would you like me to read it out? No, no I spelt it wrong anyway, so I'll I'll, I'll say it. So just as a kind of observation, um, I am. Um, I recently um, self-nominated to go onto the peer review panel at the AHRC. Um, it was such an eye-opener because of the six projects that we were given to kind of pretend to moderate, five of them had got art slapped in at the end. And the artist was not the inquirer, it, the artist was the illustrator and the, um, the uh, impact maker. And I was just so, so excited by the way you've started with these practices to open up questions and not not come up with some questions from books and then add, added some artists in to say hey look I, I just think it's quite revolutionary that in a sort of research construction way so like yeah wow and actually the way these particular artists are asking the questions are and exploring the context is diff is a different mode and it's it just feels like yeah quite revolutionary actually it's really interesting to, to hear that because i know we we've often felt like how our practices get co-opted and it's one of the big underlying conversations that we've had as we've been thinking about this that we don't want that to happen you know like they can't just be that it, it can't be the illustration if this is about kind of developing knowledge and understanding and methods that those have to be coming from the practices um so it's really interesting to hear that and maybe we can we can emphasize our revolutionaryness in a, in a better way than maybe we're doing at the moment yeah, it was really important to us that um, we we wanted the project that that placed um, kind of what can be learned from art practice in terms of methodology kind of at its at its heart to really kind of like produce something which which brings all these fascinating ways of investigating place um, brings them together as almost like a sort of toolkit we we're thinking um, that that could be used by other disciplines or at least kind of emphasizes the value of what can be generated by artistic practice in terms of understanding place. Thank you. Would anyone else, Jackie, you've turned your camera on. Is that because you're about to say something? <laughs> I, mean, I just had a thought, um, although all the artists are looking at their own sort of locale, they're sort of looking locally already because they're all in different places, you're sort of going beyond the local, which I thought was quite interesting. So they've all got different practices, they're all in different places. And yeah, there's just something really interesting about that in itself, I think. So it was just a comment really. 
Can, can I, I pick, can I, yeah. sorry, Joe, you're going to say something. I was going to just build. All, all, all I was going to say was just like, I suppose that sense that, you know, like everywhere globally, somebody's local, you know, we're just really aware of that. And, you know, I've often in the past had site specific practices. I felt really anxious about like going to somebody else's local as, as a not local to their mm. sort of thing. And so it's been quite interesting, you know, this thing of like writing from here, because my experience of, of here is obviously different to Bedwell Williams's experience of being in Wales or of whatever, but we're interested to kind of bring, bring those different locals together. So I think there is a, a global dimension. Mm. Well, Sheffield and Wales, maybe beyond that, but Luke, sorry. Hello. Becky, did you want to? Yeah, uh, sorry. I'm also super excited about. I, you know, I like endlessly find myself in sort of arguments or at least festering resent, probably, um, given that I'm not particularly argumentative, um, about just, I just love how resistant this project is to, um, you know, internationalist agenda. And I've always sort of said, if I wanted to do a study about the snails in my garden, that could equally be international level research or to engage on problems internationally. And I think this really gets at that. It's like, um, you know, resisting the need, you know, there is no reason why we can't explore the most profound of problems within our, our own locale and I, I just think this really um you know like sticks two fingers up to some of those um agendas um um uh, yeah uh, against a sort of faux internationalism uh, esther did you want to come in there sorry i couldn't see anybody else sorry no 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 just no esther. i was just i was just going yes okay right agree right. very much yeah. okay <laughs> Um, well, can I ask you a question now? You switch your camera on, Esther, in terms of oh, when you've yeah. done work, for example, in Vietnam. When you are doing sort of film film making research in, in another place, how conscious are you that you are in someone else's locality? And oh my God, massively. Absolutely. Like, it's that's a massive thing. And I am very anti-parachute. Let's go in steal the story bugger up no that yeah no I I my preference is I like to work with people there on the ground I mean in Vietnam I'm working with the Vietnam Film Institute and um a, a, a group called TPD who are basically kind of a filmmaking initiative that that teach workshops to to kids young adults um you know, they many of them have been my film crew on the ground there when I haven't been able to be there. Um, yeah, so, so that's absolute priority is to be working with people on the ground. I mean, it's the same with um, with the project I'll talk about shortly. It's the same with the project that I spoke about in the last uh, one of the previous space and place groups, which was a project in Bolsova. I think it's yeah and 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 that's and I love to learn and see from other points of view as well and be embedded in that in that community um okay yeah I'll, I'll park that thought I, 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 forgive me scsma apologies for not knowing that knowing your name but I'm just going to dive in with a question <laughs> and then, then then I'll invite your question because because you've asked to ask a question this is a question to Rosemary Joe and also to Esther and I'm afraid it's one of those kind of questions that a social scientist would ask you. When you are going into a locality that is not your own, or even when you are trying to sort of auto-examine your own locality, are you searching for essences or are you essentially constructing something to represent? Because it seems to me that some of what's being said here seems to suggest that there is an objectively existing locality that can be captured in some way. And yet some of what you're saying is that it's more about a multiplicity of experiential, everybody's got their own locality and we've got nested 
individual overlapping constructions of locality as we go about our daily daily lives and I'm just curious to know how much of an essence is in there or is necessary for example for your project Joe and Rosemary and, 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 and Esther are you trying to depict something that you feel you've empirically discovered in that locality that you're making the film about or are you conscious that actually you're telling a story that is in part something that's going to work by the rules of narrative that you know we'll tug at heartstrings or, or whatever I don't mean that too cynically <laughs> only slightly cynically um, I, I take, mean uh, sorry I was going to say Joe jo no, yeah Joe <laughs> do you want time to think about it and, and, and Esther can dive in and let, let Esther speak because she's got something to say <laughs> and well, then I was maybe just going to say to me it's a little bit a little bit of both I mean I would never I can never make a film completely objectively from somebody else's point of view but I wouldn't want to make it completely object subjectively I guess just from mine I mean yes I will have a way of looking at something and I and actually even the nature of wanting to do that project or you know kind of initiating a kind of project comes from my fascination or or that I see some magic there that I want to explore further. But then it's, you know, it's talking to others and capturing if they see magic or they see the opposite, et cetera. So it's it's a little bit of both, I would say, for me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rosemary and Jo. Um, yeah, I don't know if, um, if Jo would agree with this, but I feel like part of our kind of motivation behind putting this together um, was really trying to kind of gather the potential for creative methodologies to um, create a set of multiple perspectives, um, something to kind of be alert to the complexities of place that I would always hesitate to kind of feel like there's this essence or this truth of place that uh, um, that a creative methodology might be able to get to, which is somehow different from something that might be tried to be accessed through like interviews or statistics or something like that. Um, but I think what creative methodologies do extraordinarily well is speak to um, a kind of, uh, a, yeah, a sort of a complexity that perhaps isn't always visible in the kind of data that is generated by the kind of more typical ways of investigating a place, which is then used to make, often used to make decisions about what happens in that place. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of at the edge of what we were thinking about with this, with this application and, and kind of almost how it might, even like perhaps, have some impact on the way in which, um, for instance, kind of placemaking disciplines might start to, you know, might complicate what they do a little bit. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that we feel that there's a kind of essence of place that can be uncovered, uncovered more effectively through creative methods, but that creative methods have um ways of uncovering things that are yeah that, that kind of access the multiplicity in in more yeah sort of complex ways i know i've been reading um shannon matten's the city is not a computer book which is such a fab book and if you haven't read it already do because it's great but there's a chapter in there where she sort of talks about kind of data and data dashboards and what what can data what, what do they show you about a place like a city in, in in her case and so you know like it might show you about particular types of crime or it might show you about traffic flow or it might show you about particular types of things but it, it chooses or the data that's part of those dashboards don't show you other things that might be equally or possibly more important and I feel that as like a course leader at SHU where I'm told to look at that bloody source thing which is like a data dashboard that looks like a box of broken biscuits that is like all these graphs and different things that you're meant to look at to understand like the student journey and just like it seems so 
it's about what can be measured rather than the kind of the complexities of things that happen in the studio or when somebody's making something or they're you know being an activist or they're doing a project or whatever it, it feels like it, it data is useful I'm not saying I'm not anti-data but it's like it's only part of the story so there's something about trying to kind of as a researcher I suppose to create methods that allow other things to happen um, as well and I'm also aware that you know there is that sense in which creative methods also produce place you know like it's not that there's something already existing there something else also happens when you make um, because like new stories are told or new things are imagined so there's a complexity there it's not just about being like the the objective recorder of something you know you are intervening and, and things are happening as a result of that or you're telling your story to other people and that kind of changes things so it's, it's for all of those reasons of you know wanting the big soup pot of complexity I suppose to be bubbling away to see what what emerges from that is that a richer and more nourishing brew um, than than kind of some of the more um, you know the, the government sort of or the economic data or the you know the things that we we might normally expect to see in terms of how a place is investigated from you know there's official kind of narratives okay uh, I, I know michelle had a question i can i, I realize it's michelle now so hello oh, michelle sorry sorry hello everyone sorry when my zoom updated it knocked off my name and i realized i need to change it it's just sent me back to official shoe <laughs> labeling um uh it, so really lovely to hear about um uh, the research and it just it just strikes me that it's a a beautifully timely because everybody is engaging with this question more not not least because of the sort of as I think a couple of people have mentioned the sort of nationalist rise and the sort of co-opting of local that or sort of you know under that that happens within that so and how one might reframe an understanding of the local really because whenever i start to think about the local it it, it just unpicks itself a bit for me which i guess speaks to your thing around the complexity so only be, and there's that horrible word isn't it that is like some sort of bad i don't know thing in your mouth which is the what is it the glo local or something i don't know it's a horrible <laughs> word really bad word but it seems to me in a way you're trying to get to what that thing of the local is so I was just sort of interested at the moment where your working definition of that is as a as an I as an idea as a thing really because it seems that obviously with those these different elements you're holding different element different parts but I was just sort of interested of what that yeah working definition of this as a thing is for you at the moment I mean, personally speaking, I kind of hope maybe that's what the network will kind of help us come to, um, you know, because I think that there is probably like an, another project, which is like sort of another level of investigating this that, that is, you know, we're sort of seeing this as being maybe an 18 month thing to try to have some conversations and really try to understand sort of some of the parameters and learn from the other people, you know, who are like they're being activists in their community or they're being artists in this different location to, to kind of learn from each other and I don't know maybe I'm hedging my bets a bit but it's like I'm not really sure is my answer to you at the moment I sort of think that's what we partly want to find out um, or maybe to set that term for then the next phase of the investigation I don't know if I'm like Rosie if that's like I don't know whether you agree with that or not no I, I, I do agree with that um it's almost when we were trying, I suppose, these five themes or what, you know, areas of interest were kind of generated by our conversations about kind of like what, what is the local, what, what, what are its many meanings? Um, and, uh, and, and these are the sort of five main areas that we kind of came up with, um, unable to... <laughs> kind of unable to find a sort of shorter um more um yeah um elegant way of of coming up with this working definition um I don't know if that is something we're going to need to think more about the position as that of the to talk the right talk in terms of the uh the HRC application. Can I offer one closing thought on that point and then we'll move move, move in um, to, to Esther's presentation. Um, I think what you will need to do as you position yourself for your AHRC um, bid is work out what your relationship to and difference from 
the big glut of research that AHRC and other institutions have funded on community. So, so I think you will need to explain to yourselves and to others how local is different from, but overlaps with a bit community, because they will say, well, we've done loads of stuff on community. Why do we need to do it again to, with a new label that is local? Um, but I think putting creative investigation in place front and centre is, is, is really great in the way that everyone has said. Don't underestimate, though, that consultancies, place branding, consultancies, et cetera, are doing something that they might say is similar to what you say you're doing. So don't overclaim the ingenuity in the sense of work out what other people are doing and why you think it's a poor relation to what you think you're going to do. Um, but sorry, I, I said I, that would be a short observation. I'll leave you to digest that in your, at your leisure. Um, Esther. You're on mute. Yes, I am. Sorry, I was just typing. I was just saying uh, for Rosemary and Joanne, it might be worth you looking if you haven't, you might have already, but the, the various different connected communities projects, the HRC funded. Um, yeah, all right then. What? So I'm just going to go straight into the presentation and, sh and, and it's just going to begin with a very short little, um, well, some video footage and then we'll come back and I'll chat further. And um, the sound on this does sound like static, but that is how the sound is. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen. I'm going to do it again, because I didn't press the little share sound. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about a project that um, I've been working on really since, um, well, sort of initiated at the end of 2017, um, which is all based, it's called Ships in the Sky, and I'm calling it a social history arts project because there's lots of different strands. It's not um, simply a film. There's many, many strands to it. And the building that you've just seen, um, if you're familiar with Hull, it is um, a massive building right in the centre where this little, um, you can see on this map, it's just, this is a map that's, um, it's from around about the 30s, so some of the docks at the bottom there are, have since filled in, but uh, the building is a, just approximately where you can see the circle, and it is what was the former um, central co-op building which was later a bhs now i'm i'm from hull and when i was um a kid the the mosaic that you just saw was extremely special to me and, and i'll come on to that a little bit more but this site has been um a co-op you know previously uh, before the war it was this very grand co-op which you can see here which was actually bombed in the, the Hull Blitz. Um, and if, if you don't know much about Hull, Hull was very extremely badly bombed. It was the second worst bombed uh, city after London um, and, and then Coventry was after, after Hull. 
So it was extremely badly bombed. Um, and most of the store was uh, obliterated. And just at the bottom right here, you can see a picture that um, is the prefab. So they built a temporary store on this site once it was cleared um, until they built this fancy big new store, which you saw in, in, in that first little video. So like many uh, places across Britain and particularly those that were affected um, in the war, there was uh, this space of very quick building um, and there was lots of things going on um, in Hull. Um, and this is, this is one particular building that's just near the, the co-op, which is Festival House. So there's a lot of buildings that were built to celebrate the Festival of Britain. And the rebuilding of the co-op was, was kind, of, kind of, even though it had been bombed in the Blitz, it was also um, something that was like influenced by the Festival of Britain and kind of these ideas of, of looking to the future. So here on the left, you'll see like an original plan, which is quite a basic plan, which I found in the co-op archive that's in Manchester, um, which, which is pretty much kind of an off the shelf co-op building plan. But um, they actually, their ambition became much larger and, it, and, and um, they brought in uh, an architect who's part of the co-op um, architectural team called E.P. Andrew, Philip Andrew. And you can see this plan on the right, which, which um, was his kind of vision for this this flagship store, which when it was going to be, when it was finally built, it was one of the largest department stores in the country. And you'll see on the edge of this um, building, the, what we call the three ships mural. So the three ships mural is the thing that's like really made me want to do this project. So as a kid, um, this is one of the things that really made me want to study arts. I was always, um, something I was drawn to. It still gives me butterflies when I when I see it in the centre of Hull. And on a Saturday, I'd often sit opposite opposite this building with my dad. There was a little calf and my dad, like um, many uh, uh, boys, men from Hull, he, he was he went away to sea. And it was something that would spark off all these stories about him going off to sea. So, so to me, it was a very hopeful sign of like, what, what might the future um, hold? So it is, um, it is from the research I've done, uh, it is um, arguably the largest mosaic in the country. Um, it was by an artist called Alan Boyson, who you can just see at the top there. Um, I'm just gonna get a tile of his ready that I'm going to show you later and uh, it was after a very long campaign that I was heavily involved in it was grade two listed in 2019 so you can see here um, uh, this is an early kind of watercolour um, that Alan um, drew for, for this kind of flagship uh, store so it represents trawlers it's actually three trawlers because um we no longer have a fishing fleet um in hull that kind of died out at the end of the 60s but it was uh, you know extremely kind of strong heritage um in fact you know many of my family uh, back in the day were were trawler men and it and the the latin you can see there basically means prosper through industry now, Alan Boyson was actually a childhood friend of Philip Andrew, who was the architect of the building. And uh, Alan Boyson's dad used to work for the co-op in Marples, and he actually helped Philip get a job at the co-op and then to study architecture. So Philip, um, who, I, who I did interview before he pa sadly passed away last year, um, Philip, always try to get Alan on a job if he could. Um, and, and this, I think this really just shows like the co-op's ambition to, to 
really um, honor kind of artwork and public art for the people. This whole store was made out of really high quality materials, you know, beautiful like hardwoods, uh, brass, this mosaic, um, and Alan Boyson also did two more mosaics in the building, which I'm going to show you. Here's just um, a close up uh, section. And as you would have seen from the very beginning of the talk, um, uh, Luke used this, this image that you might have noticed a local, a local thing is that, you know, that, that the masts do spell out, out hull. Now, this, this wasn't apparently intentional, or that's what Alan said, but who knows? It, it's something, um, you know, that the, as when you're a kid in Hull, it's something that, you know, you'll be with your parents and they'll, you know, spell out Hull in the masts. So it has a real strong kind of local heritage. So in addition to the three ships mural. There's also these two other murals in the building, the fish mural, which you can see on the left here, which is situated where this section here is in, in blue. And also this mural on the right, which is a sponge print, what we're calling this, what the snappy title we've given it is the geometric sponge print mural. And this is one of that Alan Boyson's family gave me. It's a series of these kind of geometric print tiles. Now this mural, at the moment, the building is derelict um, and actually the starting demolition on the building, but this mural at the moment, there's about half of it and it's painted over. Um, but I actually, um, from filming Philip Andrew and then getting him to kind of look through all his, his archives, it was only then that we found that there was a third mural. And since then, um, obviously I let the whole city council who now own, own the building know about this. So, um, and said, you know, can this be saved? And they have said that they, they're committed to save it, although there is only half, that the family do have some of these tiles. So we're going to try in this, in the new, development, which I'll talk about shortly, that's going to be on this site, try to kind of uh, reconfigure the rest of this mural. At the top here, you'll see some ladies who used to be co-op window dresses. Um, and they sneakily snuck out um, on one of the bricks to have the photo taken in front of the fish mural when it, when it had been unveiled. Now, another remarkable aspect about this building is the this incredible, absolutely massive concrete dome, which is also kind of rimmed with beautiful little mosaic tesserae. And when this when this uh, dome was built, which was a real feat of engineering um, at the time, the only other one in the world uh, like it in its engineering was in the Kremlin. So it, it's a really incredible piece of kind of ahead of its time, uh, roof, dome, shell structure. There's, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Smithfield Market in London. They also have a big dome, which was, which was later than this, but that dome in London is um, listed. Unfortunately, this dome we weren't able to list, but we have at least managed to list the, the three ships mosaic. So what is Ships in the Sky? So Ships in the Sky is what I'm calling a social history arts project. It's really kind of a, a, a sort of a 360 degree portrait of place, if you like, um, which comes from back in 2017 when it was Hull City of Culture. Um, I was in Hull quite a lot because I was doing various different projects. And I was increasingly worried about the status of this building. It had shut in 2016 when um, after co-op closed, it became a BHS. And in 2016, as we all know, BHS closed down. So the whole building was closed down. And I was like, oh, what's going to happen to this building? And what's going to happen to this incredible piece of public artwork? So I got in touch with a local group called Hull Heritage Action Group and managed to speak to somebody who was helping out there called Lee Bird. And um, it just transpired that we were both had this massive love for the building 
And I said to them, you know, I, I'm really keen to do a kind of project about, about this building and the history of this building, um, which is, you know, a decades long, like 60, 70, 80 years long history that intersects in many ways with British history. So not just local, but with kind of national histories and many different histories from uh, labor, from women in the work workplace, from cooperatism, from uh, modernism, post-war rebuilding and um, architecture, from um, the high street and, you know, what we see is the decline of the department store to um, public artwork and ceramics. So lots of different strands and strata, as well as club culture, which also I'll show you a few, few slides later. Um, so I, I was like, okay, so, so Lee, so Lee was interested in what I wanted to do. And she, she is since she is working on the project. Um, she's doing a bit of, bit of the background historical research and a lot of the kind of marketing and social media campaigning we've done with the project. And I um, reached out to Hull Libraries, Hull Central Libraries, to see if they wanted to team up um, just to do some uh, initial kind of community engagement and to try and uh, talk to people and see what their stories were connected with this building. So we did a series of kind of mini, mini exhibitions in these different libraries around Hull in which people could come along and we could record their memory. So we did these kind of memory exchange uh, sessions um, in which people shared their thoughts, memories, and in exchange, they got our very own Ships in the Sky um, Blue Peter ripoff <laughs> badge. And we've got so many different memories. So we've got around about, well, over a hundred oral histories now, some very short, some very long, but like I said, but covering all these different themes and layers of history that this building has or layers of resonance, um, you know, from, from people going to buy uh, knitting patterns or baby clothes to this here is, is um, the car that you'll see here is there's a memory of, um, a woman who, when she was a child, she remembers sitting at the traffic lights outside uh, with her parents in the back of the car, looking up at the mural and being kind of hypnotized by it. Um, all, all these different sorts of memories. Uh, and here are some, just some uh, of the different people that we've interviewed. Here at the bottom are three of the, you saw the previous shot in front of the fish mural of the co-op window dressers. Three, th these are three of those window dressers. And I have another photograph of just the three of them in 1961 in front of the mural. So when we had a launch event for this project, which was back in February, 2019, which was at Hull Central Libraries, um, which was, we were amazed. It was like sold out within like, hours of us putting it online it was sold out and we had to actually change venue like twice so even that spoke to us of this kind of local resonance and there was also um particularly at that point this this local question if you like of what is going to happen to this building and what is going to happen to this mural um you see a tattoo there. I think I've probably collected about five or six people now who, who have a ships in the sky tattoo. And okay, and then pandemic struck, obviously, in 2020. So at that point, we'd already done a lot of oral histories. So to kind of keep a bit of momentum up, um, we put clips of some of these on both the project website and also Untold Hull's website. So Untold Hull are a part of Hull Libraries who have been recording stories um, of Hull. So they've done various different things. They've done lots of stories of, of the, the fishing industry, um, Hull Fair. And that was one of the reasons I approached them in the first place. And you, you know, you can you can listen to extracts of those. One of the things uh, about the building it, and that massive dome that you saw um, is that underneath that dome was 
various different nightclubs through the history of the building. Initially, it was the Skyline Ballroom, and it was also a music venue. Um, Jimi Hendrix played there. Um, that Pink Floyd one actually didn't happen in the end. It was rescheduled, but lots, lots of people had these quite fantastic memories about um, various gigs, and it was really formative for many people. Uh, here on the left, the Sky, Scound, Sky Sounds, that was the in-house band for the building, and I've since uh, interviewed some of the remaining members. Then it went on to Bailey's Nightclub um, in the, the 70s, and the last nightclub was uh, Romeo's and Juliet's, um, which... Um, I was just a bit too young and, and I never went to any of these nightclubs, but my, my sister did go to Romeo Juliet's and so did uh, Lee that's involved in the project. And that was closed down in 1991 by an infamous, um, a massive drugs raid. So again, I, ha I, have, I have a really great interview with somebody who was there at that drugs raid. I have even interviews talking about the very un-PC wet t-shirt competitions, um, the uh, disco dancing championship. So, you know, club culture that, that is very local, but in many ways, there, you know, it resonates across um, different people's club experiences across the country. And in addition to these oral histories, um, we've had items donated to the project. So we've got approximately well, 200 it is probably quite a bit more now, but we have overalls from, we've got basically, I've got an archive of, um, or collection of an ex-employee uh, at the co-op, including all of his employment letters and his overalls. Um, this up here is a Skyline Ballroom, just um, placemat from somebody's 21st birthday. Um, and, and this is something, you know, I'm really interested in ideas of archives, what's collected, who decides what's collected, what resonates, um, and, and what's what's kind of deemed worthy, if you like, of collecting. Um, I've also been donated lots and lots of plans of the building, as well as um, the, the, the family of Philip Andrew, the architect, the architect who, who sadly died last year, his family have, have donated me all, all of his architect drawings. So, so what am I doing with all of this stuff? Um, so, so, so far we've presented kind of elements of the project to kind of different audiences because it does span so many different themes from um, people connected to uh, the modernist society. This, these are just at the middle, at, at the top here, are from the launch event they had back in February. And that was designed, really, I wanted uh, the people who we'd interviewed to be the presenters. It wasn't about me getting up and, you know, we, we I was on the stage at parts of it talking about the project, but we had uh, DJs from the building, we had Philip Andrew there, we had some of the, the, the window dresses that I told you about, and that was a really lively, um, lively event that caused a lot of discussion and, and, and actually kind of, we also had some councillors, Hull councillors, uh, Hull city councillors in in the audience um because at that point it was very much the idea was the whole building um they wanted to demolish the whole building and we were all still very much campaigning to how can we save you know at least the murals um and we, we i i was asked to present the project to um uh, through a lecture series at Hull Hes History Centre. So Hull History Centre has um, Hull University's archives, including um, Hull Daily Mail's archives. So somewhere I'd done a lot of the re a lot of research, uh, presented the project to the British Association of Modern Mosaics. So again, very kind of different audience. Um, and also to the oral International Oral History Conference, which was it, that was supposed to take place in Singapore in 2020, 
but was obviously uh, postponed and went online. The project, uh, and the pro I must say at this stage, the project is ongoing, and these are just some, so it wasn't a matter of doing a project, then presenting the end of the project. It's kind of been lots of different phases and stages and talking about it as the project's been happening. And whilst, you know, the building is there as it is now in people's memories. So these are just um, a few examples of of where I've discussed the project. This was quite um, lovely. I'm just going to get you something to show you. Uh, the critical fish. Have I just jumped out of the slideshow? Uh, yeah, you have. So it so the critical fish, um, which is a sort of arts cultural magazine in Hull, um, they wanted to do something about the project. So we kind of did an interview, but also we got a local artist to do this um, central. It was like a centre pull-out spread poster about that links with some of the research so far about the project, and so they had access to some of the oral histories. Um, and a lot of, you know, kind of research, picture and written research so far. And then it's created this quite rather lovely um, sort of graphic piece. Um, and also Radio 4 um, approached me for one of their programmes, which kind of is about yeah, stories of art and people. Um, and I discussed the project in a section for that and with the Philip Larkin Society podcast, Philip Larkin infamously uh, well from Coventry but a poet in Hull for many years and uh, worked at Hull Library um, uh, and these are just some other little examples uh, at the end of yet last year I made a little publication which is on the right here which was published by the Modernist Society and because again there's these so many layers um, and it's this is I want to do a few more publications, but this was just taking one aspect of it and a way to share some of this ephemera, this collection that's now being built up. So it was all about the co-op connection, that particular publication. Um, yeah, and, and that was uh, published by the, the Modernist Society, which are in Manchester. So obvious, very direct links with the history of um, the co-op. Other sort of things along the way um, have been did some oral history masterclasses with um, there's quite a success as a sort of a legacy from the whole city of culture. There is now kind of a group of whole volunteers um, who get involved in all sorts of different cultural events. So we wanted to kind of do something for them and share with them. Um, so did this masterclass about um, recording oral histories which which was a lovely way and also we recorded some of these volunteers had their own memories about the building so we also recorded them or they recorded each other and um i mentioned about the campaign so there's been a campaign to save this building or to save and it, to save the three ships mural in particular and that uh, campaign had been going on since sort of late, since BHS vacated the building in 2016. Um, it was rejected, but we kept uh, going on and putting a putting another case um, to the DCMS. And one of the things a few of us did was an open letter to um, to the DCMS, which we um approach lots of different people uh in probably quite high profile arts capacity so we we had people sign this such as nicholas sorota um i won't bore you with a long list of names but a lot of people who who supported and could see kind of the value the artistic value and value for hull in itself to keep this mural and that was granted a uh, grade two listing back in November 29. And this is um, something on the 20th Century Society, which I'm a member of, 
on their website about this particular mural. So I said about, you know, trying to keep the momentum going through the lockdown um, and as well as putting some of these memories on the uh, website or extracts, he also did this campaign that we called Fish and Ships where we uh, did a series of, I'd added some drawings um, after Alan's um, three ships and his fish murals and we made these series of uh, t-shirts, uh, totes and also to link in with the, the sort of musical heritage and club culture, uh, a vinyl slip mat as well. And then uh, the profits for that went to Fair Share and the Trussell Trust. And there is actually one of their food banks right next to the, um, the co-op building. So something, we just want to do something practical, um, but that would keep the momentum going and the conversation going. And as part of that campaign, I made, which I'll, which I'll finish this talk with, um, I made a very short little poetry film um, of Philip Larkin's poem, The North Ship. And I asked all of these people on the bottom here, who all have a connection to Hull in one way or another, um, to, to film themselves basically reciting a verse of, of this Larkin poem. And we use that as a tool really to kind of reach out to people about this campaign. And, and at the same time, it was about, you know, sharing that love of the building, the work of Alan Boyson and, you know, the, the, the importance of kind of trying to campaign and to keep some of this heritage. So I'll finish off with this, with this little film, as I said. I saw three ships go sailing by Over the sea, the lifting sea And the wind rose in the morning sky And one was rigged for a long journey The first ship turned towards the west Over the sea, the running sea And by the wind was all possessed And carried to a rich country The second ship turned towards the east Over the sea, the quaking sea And the wind hunted it like a beast to anchor in captivity. The third ship drove towards the north over the sea, the darkening sea, but no breath of wind came forth and the deck shone frostily. The northern sky rose high and black over the proud, unfruitful sea. East and west, the ships came back, happily or unhappily. But the third went wide and far into an unforgiving sea under a fire spilling star and it was rigged for a long journey So they are, these are just some photographs that people uh, shared via social media of them in the t-shirts or as you can see at the bottom there we've had a few pies, <laughs> pictures of pies being sent in with, with um, three ships and I've done a, pump, a few pumpkins um, etc and again it's just all about kind of you know keeping that conversation going and you know what is it that, that, that people um, see as magical I guess, of this particular place. So, so going on with this project, um, the idea is um, to culminate in a large kind of multi-stranded exhibition. 
I'm speaking with various uh, venues in Hull about that. And uh, my aim is to do that next year, which would be the 60th anniversary of when uh, the Three Ships Mosaic was installed. Um, and uh, that would include uh, a multi-screen artist film piece, as well as uh, some of these original uh, architectural drawings, maps, etc. Some of the do donated materials that people have kindly given um, to the project, uh, and also a series, a, a photography series. And I would like at some point to almost package a sample of this material to then go back into the archive um, and hopefully donate to Hull History Centre as, um, as a different type of archive or a different type of collection of people's, people's histories and love or connection to place. And um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. And there's lots more to say because there's so many different strands of the project, but I hope I give, that gives you a little, a little bit of a flavour of, of where I am at the moment. Um, I have been given permission to film inside the building. As I said, they are, they have started to demolish the building around the three ships mosaic and they're going to cut out the fish mural and the, and the um, sponge print mural. And there, there is going to be a new building, uh, a new complex that's built on that site of which the three ships will still feature heavily. That's if hopefully nothing happens to it through through the, the demolition. The demolition is going to take around 85, 86 weeks. So it's a long and um, projected process. So thank you for listening of to me rambling of all the different strands. Thank, <laughs> thanks, Esther. Um, can, can I dive straight in uh, with a yeah. question and then let others gather their thoughts? Um, strikes me that what you've done clearly is sort of from 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 the heart you explain really clearly the way in which it sort of grows out of your connection to the whole um it's a sort of symbolic archaeology or rescue archaeology you you can't save the building though you tried but you're trying to save both the mural as a fragment but also to to send into sort of posterity the image by 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 multiplying its 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 disseminating it in, in the world i guess um and i'm and, I, and i'm trying to think how that might connect back to the question that i i sort of threw out but can't really resolve which is to what extent we need to repurpose the word nostalgia or whether you would violently reject that there's anything nostalgic whatsoever about your desire to somehow save a portion of this building well where are you on the on that, on that? well i mean the style just become a bit of a dirty word hasn't it like like it's a it's a bad thing and and there is clearly parts of this project that are nostalgic well, you know when i'm talking to you know people interviewing them many of them you know it was i don't know where they had their first kiss on the dance floor in romeo's and juliet's or you know they can't be help but be nostalgic about going to see Jimmy and Hendrix or Eartha Kitt or or going to buy the first pram, you know, or even to the point of you know, um, it, you know, the whole thing of the co the co op in particular is that whole cradle to the grave notion, isn't it? So, so there is going to be very much um, a part of it about looking back, but. I'm really interested in this whole thing of place making um, what makes a place, but also the connection of the, the local and the national. And what I'm trying to do is through the, the kind of larger mosaic, uh, no pun intended, of the, of the project is to kind of look at how this particular local place maps across kind of 20th century um, history across Britain throughout these decades and I, i'm really kind of interested in that strata so i i think it's also kind of about looking to the future and um looking to about look at, and also looking about what's what's remembered or what's what's taken care of or held of or what's deemed worthy of preserving so to me there, there is nostalgia but to me it's also about looking 
looking to the future and it's it's kind of a conversation between those two points sort of fueling the future with bits of the past yeah nikki from you anyway. yeah um i sort of slightly i suppose building on what you said and also thinking back to um what um joe said at the beginning about sort of dashboards and the sort of metrics that are used by um uh you know governments and other things to sort of measure things and how sort of deficient um they can be and uh and uh, thinking about your sort of um attempts to to keep that building um intact and it made me think about obviously there's some quite recent um, drivers from professional bodies and the government and things about trying to maintain or uh, re retain Repurpose. sorry buildings yeah and yeah this idea of embodied carbon and you know yeah. reuse rather than you know destroy and rebuild sort of thing and how that might change some of these um, views of local places and of these mm -hmm. sort of buildings that have these histories and how it's going to force people perhaps to look at them in terms of what you can do with that building rather than saying oh that's never going to work for you know mm -hmm. x new purpose so we'll just ditch it and move on and also what that will mean for how localities will develop because they'll have these you know longer standing structures that have these you know well, layers of, of history i think uh, both myself and Lee that I mentioned, and um, we've been very much of that view about, you know, not trying to keep the building there in aspect or anything, but about repurposing that structure and celebrating its heritage, but using it in a way that can be used for now. You know, filming inside the building, it under that dome, that that is an incredibly theatrical incredible space you know there's a sprung dance floor yes it'll it, it would need redoing but what what would that look like now as a performance space what would like one of the floors that which you know it's got a massive footprint what if one floor was i don't know an indoor skate park what if another floor was mixed use coffee shops art spaces you know, I, I'm very much for the um, reuse um, and repurpose. I mean, that whole that whole um, this is this is a very big uh, conversation going on, particularly at the moment with X, with what was once uh, department stores and um, C20, who I mentioned before, they've got um, a campaign going about how we can recognize and reuse, repurpose these buildings. Um, you might have heard recently that m and is a flagship store on Oxford Street that they've put in planning to pull that down. Um, C20 members, um, myself included, you know, have signed quite a lot of petitions about how can they relook at what they have there and repurpose that. And the other thing is, is like some of the, of my views, particularly in, in terms of the whole building, the kind of what's been offered as a replacement, what does it really add um, that the, the, can't be there with the repurposing? There's quite a lot of kind of homogenized uh, ideas of, of what replaces these things and, and how, how long will they really be relevant in terms of architecture or design, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I could go on and vent, but I shall not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions or indeed comments? Joe. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, and thanks, Esther. Um, it's, you know, I love that mural too. I think it's a really sort of special um, place. And it's, it's, you know, yeah, I was so relieved. Magic. When it finally saved. Um, I, I, maybe I'm thinking a little bit about Luke's comment about the um, like about nostalgia and thinking like what are the what might be the the sort of positive purposes of nostalgia here and like one of the things that really strikes me was the you know in that kind of post-war rebuilding of you know kind of when so many of those modernist buildings were built like you know they're here in Sheffield like I'm thinking about the co-op building that now houses commune yeah. oh, thinking a little John bit about Lewis. what might what might happen with John Lewis now yeah. that Cole Brothers is shot 
that there, there's some, there was something in that post-war period, I suppose, that was like about a kind of maybe an optimism towards um, like an ambition for like good design for, for ordinary people. And I Absolutely. kind of like feel like whether, is there a, a part of the nostalgia for that time, which is about recognising the quality of some of those, you know, those aims and the kind of the sense that it was coming out of yeah. the social, you, know, you think about the co-op and you think about John Lewis and its model of ownership and things. And I suppose like I'm wondering whether those kind of stories being told now can be, can offer alternative sort of political dimensions that counter some of that particular sort of developer led particular sort of political agendas of place that you know thinking about how political Sheffield once was about its aspirations for its architecture that it brought people from Russia and France over to come and look at the Gleadless Valley and to look yeah. at the you know the kind of the innovative architecture and I don't know like I know at the moment there, there seems so little money that is coming back you know, down to the regions, whatever the levelling up agenda. But my, my hope, I suppose, for the the role of nostalgia might be that we don't forget that other things were possible. That that is a that is a really strong kind of element of the project. Um, those kinds of ideas and hope, and um, that nothing's too good for the people. You know, why can't we use you know, the, the beautiful hardwoods, like I was saying, and um, amazing trims and things all across the building um I was just then thinking also of Sheffield you know the central library which is you know earlier but it still has that you know kind of uh, the grand grandeur for the people a beautiful you know place to to be in it doesn't have to be you know just bottom all bottom of the range um I mean I think I think the other thing is is that the idea of community and a, a space where all sectors of community mix and could be is is a strong element and even kind of how we've approached kind of reaching out to people and we've got you know a lot of sort of our twitter and instagram and our kind of social media campaign has been really important for this project and bringing lots of kind of interest and lots of different people not just local you know actually in, internationally together to talk about a lot a lot of these themes so we've got this one structure in this one place but it embodies many many themes that I think reach much further um and and you know also there's the kind of the whole conversation starting point of um what does what do cities of culture do for cities um and you know what's kind of saved and regenerated um and this kind of you know this project was on on the cusp of that with Hull having city of culture in 2017 and that's a whole different that's another conversation but it's still part of this conversation kind of seeded in place making I, I don't know if that answers your question Joanne I kind of I hope I hope it has a little bit <laughs> I think it was just yeah that sort of sense of like what is the, the purpose of doing this kind of work feels like that you know in a positive way that is a yes there is nostalgia but that that also has like generative possibilities it's not it's not about looking back it's about yeah. remembering so as not to forget what might be possible I suppose yeah but also to know what is possible now what is possible you know and and bringing all this and, and it's kind of it's been very intergenerational the project which which I love, you know, getting viewpoints also from a different standpoint in time. Excellent. Well, folks, thank you. Um, thank you, Esther. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, um, Rosemary. Um, we've gone past four o'clock, so I mustn't drag this out. But um, Sorry. Well, no, 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 my fault. I'm, well, nobody's fault. Um, <laughs> We're two minutes over and um, thank you very much to everybody um it's been great um the recording will be uploaded tomorrow evening um and um please tune in next time for more fun and games thank you luke thank you all right cheerio everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Have a good evening thank you. Bye. Bye. bye bye